Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you here today for the IUCN event on mitigating biodiversity impacts in solar and wind energy. IUCN has been working for the past 18 months with the Biodiversity Consultancy, EDF, EDP, Shell, BirdLife International, Fauna Flora International, the Nature Conservancy and Wildlife Conservation Society in what is a very pretty unique setup, I have to say. Today, the launch of the guidelines will offer an opportunity to share some of the challenges and solutions that we have discussed throughout these 18 months, which have been basically captured also in the guidelines. But before I do that, I'd like to share a couple of housekeeping announcements. Thank you, Gillian. So keep an eye on the chat on the YouTube. This is where we are gonna drop information about the speakers. The links to the guidelines, the slides, the links to the recorded event and few bits and pieces will be sent out to all the registered participants after the event. If you have questions during the event, you can post your questions in the YouTube chat and then Edward Pollard from the Biodiversity Consultancy and Ella Diara from IUCN will do their very best to reply to as many questions as possible. You can always contact us after the event at the email biobiz at iucn.org. So enjoy the event. And now I'm very, very pleased to announce uh, Bruno, Dr. Bruno Oberle, Director General of IUCN for the welcome. Thank you, Dr. Bruno. You might unmute yourself, Mr. Oberle. Can you hear me better now? It's perfect. Yeah, thank you very much, Julia. And uh, welcome everyone. It is my pleasure to be part of this event today. As you know, our planet is at a critical environmental juncture. As we face climate and biodiversity crises that are fueling each other. The complexity of reaching these goals simultaneously should not be underestimated. We need to establish collaboration across sectors. Therefore, for this work, we joined forces with a number of key players. The energy industry on one side, EDF, ADP, and the Shell Group, which provided invaluable technical and financial support. And IUCN members, BirdLife International, Fauna and Flora International, the Nature Conservancies, and Wildlife Conservation Society, all of whom made substantial contributions to the report and the biodiversity consultancy, which delivered expert advice and technical support as a co-publisher. Noble energy, along with measures to enhance energy efficiency and to manage energy demand, can play a crucial role in helping us to address the biodiversity and climate crisis. There is a great promise Renewables are the fastest growing source of energy on the planet, but only 11% of world's final energy consumption comes from modern renewables like hydro, wind, and solar. Still, we must be cautious when working to improve these figures. 70% of the world's large scale renewable energy facilities operate within boundaries of areas important for biodiversity. We need to increase global commitments to renewable energy and at the same time, integrate proper safeguards from the outset to ensure the nature and people will not be affected by the negative consequences from this development. The transition to a new energy paradigm must be both carbon neutral and nature positive. As you will hear today, Solar and wind technology pose a number of threats to nature. However, the report being released today will show us how this impact can be avoided or at least minimized. The new guidelines mitigating biodiversity impacts associated with solar and wind energy development aim to help all actors better understand and manage the biodiversity risk associated with these develop developments. The pandemic economic recovery packages have presented unprecedented opportunity to get this right, and we must grab this chance. Now to hear more, 
about the new guidelines, I will hand over back to the team. Julia, over to you. Thank you very much, Bruno. And thank you for joining us today. Um, I'd like now to ask, uh, invite uh, Stuart McGuinness, Global Director IUCN, for also uh, an introduction to today's event. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much, Julia, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, colleagues and friends. I'm really happy to, to, uh, to be here to uh, give the opening presentation. I think we're, uh, Bruno's already said, and I, I think this is clear for many of us, that over the last few years, we've seen this growing recognition that there is a confluence of two major crises which are going to shape us and shape our future for, uh, for one generation, two generations perhaps in, in advance, the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. And of course, last year, this has been exacerbated by a significant public health crisis as well. So I, there, as Bruno highlighted, it is important we actually start to think about how we can work these, these solutions through in tandem. And I want to begin by really emphasizing that it is important, that, that it is an absolute imperative that we must clear the way to see a massive scale up of renewables um, if we are going to decarbonize the economy um, and, and provide a healthy, safe living environment for, um, for ourselves and for future generations. And that, that, and that this is done within scientific norms within the next 30 years, a sense of urgency is critical. However, I think we also need to recognize that this scale up will have impacts on ecosystems, on biodiversity, and on a nat nature dependent livelihoods. That the, this is something we, we cannot pretend just because the technology is green that there will be no that there are no risks or downsides to it. However, the real opportunity, and I think the, the, the report highlights this, there is an opportunity to anticipate these and get ahead of that. So just in the, in the next five minutes or so, I'd just like to leave three uh, messages, three key messages for, for your reflection. I think the very first one is that we really need to optimize planning and siting of uh, at scale renewables that it's important to get ahead of this and to, and to recognize that not all sites are equal. Some sites are actually much, uh, some sites may be ideal for renewables, but they may also have different levels of impacts and degrees of impacts on um, biodiversity and, uh, uh, and the provision of ecosystem services. And that, uh, in identifying and optimizing where we site uh, renewable energy schemes, it's really important then that we also identify that there may be areas that really do qualify as no-go and we need to really have that discussion and, uh, and, uh, and, and draw conclusions about where are the areas that we actually feel that, that need to be protected um, from, uh, from, from the impacts and that we cannot offset the impacts of these large initiatives. I will highlight that some of the progressive uh, oil and gas majors like Shell, like Total, like BP have already dealt with that in, in, in terms of their own industry and their own sector. So we'll need to ensure that we, we have a similar discussion with the, with the renewables. Uh, the second point is that it's going to be critical that we adopt and optimize and monitor best operational practice to minimize the impacts on biodiversity and ecosystems and the services they provide. And I really highlight here the, the importance of monitoring. You cannot, the, the good intentions are great, but they have to be tracked, that we have to be able to follow them. We have to be able to take science-based uh, decisions on that. And so that does mean that we need to put in place active monitoring programs that will actually look at the impacts on biodiversity and ecosystems over the long term. I'll also emphasize this is not just about trying to simply say, again, saying we, we've got to stop operations, but it's actually to be able to use and schedule in operations in a more intelligent way. Perhaps there are times when the operations have to be slowed down. Um, for example, let's say during the migratory season of, 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 uh, uh, of, of um, 
various avian species and other times it can operate normally. So, but this will only come if we can actually monitor and track. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to really identify where we can bring in nature-based solutions that can both optimize the resilience and the security of the, of the, the, the renewable infrastructure, but also add to and, and, and support the, uh, the uh, delivery of, and the continued delivery of uh, ecosystem services and biodiversity. And the final point I'd like to uh, focus on is just that we must also pay uh, more attention to the upstream impacts. Um, I, we're all enthusiastic. I, I really do believe we want to see renewables go to scale quickly, but we've also got to recognize that we will be drawing on uh, um, certain metals, certain minerals. We, we will probably see an expansion of some sectors. And that means we need to be really, uh, we need to be thoughtful and mindful of where we're sourcing raw materials and the impacts that they can have. So in conclusion, I would really like to sort of commend the, um, the IUCN and the, and the Biodiversity Consultancy Report on, on mitigating biodiversity impacts associated with solar and wind energy development. Um, I, I think actually it really does synthesize the, the state of the art knowledge of where we are at, at the minute. It is, it draws on a huge amount of knowledge from a range of sectors. And I really want to acknowledge that the private sector input who helped us, uh, uh, who helped us in, in that respect. And I think it really gives a very solid foundation for how to move forward. Now, this is not the end. I think this is the beginning. We, as new technologies emerge to harness nature's energy, we will need to remain ahead of the curve. We will need to ensure that we are we are being science led in our responses. But I think this is an extremely good start. And I would really like to command the team who have worked on this. I would also say that we will continue to work on this here. Um, in, a, in a few months, we will be producing more guidance aimed at the finance sector on investment screening for renewables. So I would just like to conclude by saying thank you very much to all those who are involved. And I really look forward to hearing the uh, discussions over the next hour. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart, for joining us today. Um, so now it's time to dive into the different panels with the, our experts. I'd like to invite the panelists in uh, panel one and uh, Leon to turn on their videos. And Leon will be your chair for this first session. Over to you, Leon. Thank you very much, Julia. And on our first panel, which is looking at consequences and solutions, we have four very knowledgeable speakers from IUCN members who've all been closely involved in developing these guidelines. They'll share some insights into some of the diversity of issues that can affect biodiversity as unintended consequences of renewables projects. And more importantly, some of the practical solutions that can be put in place to address these. I'm not gonna introduce them in detail because there'll be info on their um, background, etc., cetera, come up in the YouTube chat. So I think we'll go first of all, straight away to Tris for a look at some of the issues involving in particular birds. Tris, I think you're on mute. In India. Oh. So a little technical hitch there. Sounds like Tris's message is coming across on YouTube but not on our internal system. Let's just try again. OK, 
get off from there. Tackling the climate change emergency requires a rapid worldwide transition to renewable energy technologies. However, such a comprehensive reshaping of our global energy infrastructure could pose significant threats to wildlife, especially birds. Not only does inappropriately cited renewable energy destroy important bird habitats, birds can also be impacted through collision with infrastructure such as turbine blades and power lines and through displacement from their key foraging grounds, flight paths and migration routes. At its most serious, poorly planned renewable energy could even contribute to global extinctions. The deserts of Western Rajasthan and India have experienced rapid growth in wind and solar energy. This in turn has resulted in hundreds of kilometres of new power lines. Yet this region also contains some of the last dwindling populations of Great Indian Bustard, an iconic species and the planet's heaviest flying bird. Sadly, collision with power lines is now the principal cause of mortality for the Great Indian Bustard. It will be a tragic own goal if before any bird extinction had been attributed to climate change, a species was to be pushed into oblivion because of poorly planned renewable energy. Fortunately, this need not be the case. Wind and solar radiation are widespread resources and there is considerable scope to choose locations for development where the impact on birds and other wildlife will be minimal. Evidence from multiple regions and at multiple scales demonstrates that with careful, strategic and proactive planning, it is possible to meet renewable energy targets without adversely affecting biodiversity. BirdLife International has pioneered the development of avian sensitivity maps, which clearly identify areas where conflict between birds and renewable energy infrastructure is likely to occur and should therefore be avoided. Such maps are increasingly recognised as an essential precursor to renewable energy expansion and the first step to ensuring the effective implementation of the mitigation hierarchy. It may be tempting to portray the negative impacts of renewable energy on birds and biodiversity as a regrettable but ultimately unavoidable consequence of our urgent need to move away from CO2 emitting fossil fuels. However, the guidance being launched today demonstrates otherwise. It clearly outlines measures that if taken will enable us to both realise our renewable energy goals and to do so without jeopardising the integrity of the natural world on which we all depend. Thank you very much, Tris. I'm sorry for the little technical hitch at the beginning there. And thank you for highlighting how information on birds, which BirdLife, of course, has pioneered, and sensitivity mapping approaches can really help us to deal with this issue of finding the right places to put renewable energy. And I'd like to ask uh, Pippa Howard now from Fauna Flora International to talk to us a little bit about the upstream issues that were highlighted a bit earlier, how we deal with the materials um, that are need to be sourced to put renewables into place. Pippa. Over to you. Thanks very much, Leon. Yes, I'm going to focus on the full supply chain custody um, and the fact that we all have a responsibility. Next slide, please. We all have um, read about the demand of the transition to uh, decarbonized energy and what that will have on raw materials. And the World Bank and others have recently re released reports that talk to the continued need for mining and that we have to ensure climate smart mining now, the World Bank's most recent report, Minerals for Climate Action, finds that the production of minerals such as graphite, lithium and co cobalt could increase by nearly 500% by 2050 to meet the growing demands for clean energy technologies. And it's estimated that over 3 billion tonnes of minerals and metals will be needed to deploy uh, wind and solar and geothermal power, as well as the energy storage that's required to achieve a below 2 degree future. Now, while the growing demand for minerals and metals provides economic opportunities for resource-rich um, developing countries and the private sector entities alike, significant challenges and impacts will likely emerge if the climate-driven clean energy transition is not managed responsibly and sustainably. In other words, the clean energy transition will be significantly mineral intensive. Where will these raw materials come from and what will the impacts of this be? Now, next slide, please. The footprints of mining overshadow a lot of things. And if we're not careful, the green transition may not be very green at all. Next slide. And the next one. So FFI did a great report for the World Bank in 2019 on forest smart mining, which actually demonstrated how significant the induced and indirect impacts of mining are on forest ecosystems, which has obvious implications on climate mitigation and resilience, not only on carbon stocks, but also on the integrity of the ecosystems that regulate and manage water and other key ecosystem services. Next slide. 
So there is also an increased incre uh, interest in some quarters in the development of deep seabed mining, primarily in our global commons, with much attention focused on the Pacific, Atlantic and Indian Oceans. And a classic and oversold story has been evolving from a hungry deep sea mining corporate developers that uh, minerals found in the incredibly unique and vulnerable depths of our oceans are the answer to our climate woes. The truth is the impacts and risks of ocean health and function are critical, and this is a highly impactful and risky trajectory. Next slide. Fundamentally, minerals mined traditionally are derived from past biological environments. While deep seabed mining could entail mining living life forms that are responsible for creating and maintaining the conditions of life itself, now removing polymetallic nodules, for example, would be like removing coral reef systems and associated biodiversity to create cement. That's the analogy. And we could be or would be removing entire ecosystems involved in trace metal synthesis and regulation and carbon sequestration and really messing with the biological pump of the oceans. Next slide. So, so what does this mean for us all, um, those of us trying to do things responsibly and sustainably? Well, we have to do a thorough due diligence on the entire supply chain of our raw materials. We have to know where they're coming from, what the environmental and social impacts of each of these are along its, their entire uh, chain of uh, custody. We need to think about um, this from a mine to widget to solar panel to wind turbine blade. And we need not only to know what their credentials are, we need to recycle these materials. We need to build them with the circular economy in mind and to not compromise this in any respect. So you know, the huge demand for resources requires huge innovation and great deal of care and really good governance. And that needs to be from a, both a voluntary and compliance perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pippa, especially for highlighting some of these less visible potential impacts of renewable energy. Most of us wouldn't think about the deep sea, for example, when we see a cellar or a wind farm. Of course, these developments have uh, visible impacts on the landscape as well, visible presence in the landscape. And I'd like to ask Joe Kiesecke from Nature Conservancy now to tell us a bit more about that visible presence and how that might be addressed in terms of mitigation. Joe, go ahead. Thanks, Leon. And thanks, Julia and the team for the opportunity to present. The report launch is at a critical moment as it's clear that climate change is no longer a thing that will happen at some point in the future. It's here now, so we need practical action now. Next slide. TNC has three main focal areas towards tackling climate change, improving climate policy commitments, natural climate solutions, and renewable energy siting solutions. The latter is critical given that the, the majority of emissions come from energy as this graphic from WRI illustrates. So we need a rapid overhaul of our energy system away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy. Next slide. But that transition is not gonna be without its challenges. We have a lot of renewable energy to build, greater than 10 times our current installed capacity. Um, the reality is that wind and solar take a lot of space in comparison to some fossil fuels. Potential for land use conflicts is high and these conflicts may slow the transition. Next slide. We already see conflicts in the renewable energy that's been built. This is a, a, a graphic from the paper by Ryden et al. Um, they identified 2,200 uh, plus renewable energy facilities that were built in protected areas and in critical biodiversity areas and wilderness areas with another 900 plus under development in the same. Next slide. So conflicts over renewable energy in the environment and social issues grace the front pages of newspapers on a, on a regular basis. These are actually from India, um, one of the 10 plus countries where we're working actively on renewable energy siting work. Um, they were assembled by my colleague, Dabba Magandhi. Next slide. I, I won't go into detail, but there are also studies emerging that show that poor siting can result in delays and higher costs, in some cases significant delays and in, in significant increases in cost. You can check out those studies. Next slide. Looking forward, some colleagues and I have projected the unintended environmental consequences of the Paris Climate Agreement if it follows a, a business as usual approach to meeting renewable energy targets. We translated country NDCs into actionable renewable energy targets and placed those footprints on the ground. We found that 3.1 million hectares of critical biodiversity areas could be impacted. 
1,500 uh, threatened and endangered species ranges could be impacted. We also found that about a million hectares of natural lands could be lost, releasing 1.5 gigatons of CO2, which equals uh, almost 9% of the total parents climate emissions uh, reduction targets. Next slide. But the other half of that same study found that the world has 17 times the area needed to meet required energy targets on converted lands that also have viable renewable energy, like built infrastructure, rooftops, mine sites, other brownfields, and other industrial areas, including agricultural areas where that's appropriate. Most countries, including the top 10 emitters, can meet the Paris Agreement goals on these lower impact areas. And that's great news. Um, but steering renewable energy towards these lower conflict sites won't happen on its own. Um, the pattern that we're seeing globally is something that we see repeated at a national scale, regional scale, and even landscape scale. Impacts if we don't do it right, but a lot of opportunities in order to, to fit the, the footprint in. Next slide. Right now, when it comes to reducing conflicts and mitigating the impacts of biodiversity from development, we spend a disproportionate amount of our time, energy, and funding working reactively at the site or project level. We need to shift to phases that are earlier in the planning process and at larger spatial scales. The conservation community is also comfortable with telling governments and industry where they shouldn't develop, but we need to work more cooperatively to help use our data and our convening power to ID renewable energy go areas if we want to see that rapid transition that's needed. There's also tremendous untapped opportunity to insert environmental and social data into planning models that precede development, such as capacity expansion models and dispatch models, moving our engagement even earlier in the planning process to make them smart from the start. Next and last slide. Um, if you're interested in, in, in reading more about TNC's work in this space, you can check out some of these sites. Um, really want to say thank you for the opportunity to present again and back to you. Thanks very much, Joe. And thank you for highlighting so clearly the need for proactive upstream planning in a strategic way so we can make sure we can site and scale up renewables in a way that isn't going to damage biodiversity unnecessarily. Now, most of the maps there, most of the emphasis in the talk so far has been on the terrestrial environment. But of course, there's enormous potential for offshore wind and a huge amount of growing interest in that at the moment. And the issues in the marine environment are complicated and rather different than they are on land. So I'd like to invite now Howard Rosenbaum from the Wildlife Conservation Society to give us just a little bit of an insight into some of these marine issues and how they can be dealt with. Howard, please go ahead. Thank you, Leon, and, and uh, this will be just a, a very brief tour of some of the issues related to offshore wind development and potential issues and solutions related to marine mammals. Uh, next slide. So the, um, the, 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 the case study that I'm going to present it actually sets up nicely for thinking about how the global guidance can play out um, in other parts of the world related to offshore wind development. And I'm going to talk about the emerging extent of offshore wind um, on the eastern seaboard of the Atlantic, which stretches um, from Maine to, no uh, to North Carolina. Only a portion of that in the mid-Atlantic is shown on the slide to the, um, to the left. And, but you can see on the, on the right side of the slide, where, um, you know, my right, the, um, you know, how lease areas from different developers can adjoin one another and which can be important habitats for um, a variety of different marine wildlife, including marine mammals. Next slide. Um, at the same time, and, and what's been really important um, is that um, ocean noise has been an increasing issue of global concern. Um, you may know that whales and marine mammals rely on sound and that noise can have a variety of impacts shown in this slide. Um, within the last few years, increasing levels of noise have been recognized locally, regionally, and even globally, and have um, been at the forefront of, ish, um, of the of IUCN and other uh, international fora. And um, many of the ocean noise issues um, relate to various stages of offshore wind development. Um, and, and, and can have potential impacts. Next slide. What, what we do know about the issues um, around ocean noise, um, and there's some important lessons learned for, um, with around uh, potential impacts um, and, uh, and, and how that manifests um, with marine mammals has been learned from the European context. 
But what's different um, in the Eastern Seaboard of the United States and probably many places around the world were um, some of these charismatic um, large endangered whales um, that, that may not be present to the same extent um, that they are on the Eastern Seaboard of the United States, including two of the largest animals that have ever lived, the blue whale and the fin whale, um, a charismatic and iconic humpback whales and, and a critically endangered species, the North Atlantic right whale for which there are less than 370 individuals. And I think the guidance sets out, you know, the, a, a very nice approach um, here. And here I'm showing some, so I'll talk a little bit more about the work that we're doing in the New York bite around offshore wind development. You'll probably hear a little bit more about that from my colleague, um, Kate McCullen Press uh, in a later panel um, from NYSERDA um, about, about a, a multi-stakeholder process. But the, the guidance sets up um, the various stages of offshore wind development from site characterization to design to construction um, and even to end of life and, and takes into account the mitigation hierarchy. It offers a framework um, for which um, those types of potential impacts like ocean noise and, uh, and vessel collisions come into play and how the mitigation hierarchy might come into effect. Effect. Next slide. Um, so with respect to ocean noise, um, you know, I think there's a lot of good thinking around this. And, um, and again, without getting into very descriptive or prescriptive um, uh, approaches, passive acoustic monitoring uh, offers a, an important approach. Um, it can help generate baseline um, distribution and seasonality for key marine mammal species. Um, it's becoming very cost effective and, um, and is, a, is very useful around the world. And there's a lot of thinking here. And I provide a recent paper that we published in 2021 um, that provides some guidance looking across various um, accords and uh, international policy efforts um, outlining various recommendations. Um, and there's good guidance here um, from IUCN and beyond. Next slide. It's also important, and I think one of the things that we do in the guidance that's, that's very useful is thinking about you know, the impacts and potential impacts um, beyond just offshore wind development, putting that in context. Um, these have Im impacts both to individuals, populations, and their habitat, but seeing it in context from the, the range of human-induced mortalities for large whales, including ship strikes and entanglement, particularly um, in, this, in this coast along the eastern seaboard of the United States, where we have what's called an unusual mortality event, um, where you know, animals are um, are, are um, you know, subject to mortalities at disproportionate rates, including humpback whales, minke whales, and those North Atlantic right whales. Um, and you can see the range of potential activities in addition to offshore wind that are of concern. And I think this is something that, you know, uh, the offshore wind development community, the various states, and the federal government in the United States are beginning to think about. And I think there'll be some good thinking coming out of processes um, related to cumulative impacts on marine mammals. Next slide. And with that, I wanted to kind of close with um, some ways in which we're using technology and as to offer solutions here, and in particularly related to critically endangered North Atlantic right whales with the deployment of near real time acoustic detecting technology, so that when a right whale vocalizes, we can detect those animals in near real time. It, it, those detections of right whales um, trigger a vessel slowdown request from the regulatory agency, from NOAA to, um, to mariners to go out. Um, that's in addition to an already in place seasonal management area. You can see where there, where um, ships are meant to slow down when right whales during seasons when right whales are present, but that will extend those slowdowns for up to three weeks. And you can see that this technology um, has already has a benefit for slowing ship downs to avoid ship strikes of animals um, if, if it's adhered to and enforced. So you can begin to think about the use of this near real-time acoustic technology for detecting whales, not just right whales, other large whales in potential stages of offshore wind development for early warnings for vessel transits, for pile driving, um, for noise, other noise generating activities um, that might um, trigger, uh, in essence, uh, you know, mitigation efforts around um, highly sensitive marine mammals. And it's a, it's a, a great way forward um, in terms of you know, the application of technology to offshore wind development. Next slide. And I'd just like to thank um, um, our colleagues at IUCN and all the colleagues that participate in the guidance for the chance to kind of shed a little light on impacts related to marine mammals, um, considerations and solutions. Thank you. Many thanks, Howard, for giving us a glimpse into some of the complex issues in the marine realm for offshore wind and how those can be dealt with. And thanks to all our speakers. We didn't give you much time to talk, I think you've given us some really clear insight into many of the issues that are covered in the guidance. And of course, I'd encourage you all to have a look at the guidelines in due course and see the information that's there, including case studies and all these points. 
But now, as time is running on, I'll hand back to Julia to take the webinar forward. Julia. Thank you very much, Leon, and thank you very much to our four first four panelists. And now it's time for a second round and where we are going to have our colleagues from the three companies that have supported the process and our new chair, Jan Willem. Over to you, Jan Willem. Thank you very much, Julia, and thank you to everyone who is uh, attending today's launch event. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to, uh, to introduce our, our three panelists, um, Etienne from EDF, Sarah from EDP, and Kuhn from Shell Renewables and Energy Solutions. Um, the three speakers are going to briefly highlight some of the practical um, actions, conservation actions that are being implemented uh, at the project level, both uh, for solar and wind projects um, to showcase what can actually be achieved to contribute to conservation efforts on the ground and indeed to enhance biodiversity values at these development sites as well. So with that in mind, I'd like to um, hand the floor over to Etchen of EDF to talk a little bit about the work that they're doing in France on solar farms. Thank you, Jan Willem, and hello, everyone. I'm going to give you an example of our EDF Renewable Group's commitment to the environment and biodiversity through a case study in France, which you can find in the guideline in details, the Environmental Management Plan, or EMP. This EMP is used in the context of vegetation management for solar farm in operation. Next slide, please. During this presentation, I will specifically focus on the environmental, environmental tool deployed when the solar farm maintenance begins after construction. EMP has been voluntarily deployed by the environment expert team in the operation and maintenance in France since 2011 in order to ensure that biodiversity, both common and remarkable, is integrated upstream of intervention of the vegetation. In addition, last year, a commitment on the implementation of the MP on 100% of the solar farm with the biodiversity issues was made by EDF Renewable in the framework of EDF Act for, Nat Act for Nature Convention. Next slide, please. What is an MP? It's an operational management tool that mainly consisting of two parts. First, a map of the solar farm that identify all the habitats present. That can be varied, as you can see in the illustration below. There may be issues related to particular habitat, like wet ditch or specific species. For example, the butterfly in the picture at the top right will complete part of its life cycle as a caterpillar, only on some species of grass that you can see between ferns. These ferns are threatened to cover them without maintenance. It's the same issues for the butterfly underneath. Its caterpillar is dependent of the plant growing under the panel thanks to shading. If plants are mow at the wrong season of the year, the eggs laid under the leaves can be destroyed. Therefore, the second part of the EMP is a dashboard that defines for each area the specific maintenance measures to be implemented and the period in the year when they must be carried out to ensure that the species present are maintained or sometime that the settlement of new species is allowed. This is the case for a very large number of species when the site is well managed from large mammal to many insects like bees. Of course, during the year of the good implementation is checked by the expert of the environmental team and the measure adapted each year according to the evolution of the solar farm. Next slide, please. Why an EMP? We have to manage the vegetation on solar farm for obvious reasons. First of all, safety, especially for the operator who work on the site and must have an access under the panels. The second reason is, of course, the production of solar energy. You can see from the picture in the middle that soft plant can grow very quickly and shed the panel. The implementation of EMPs make it possible to ensure that the third level with the environment and biodiversity issues is well integrated with the same rigor. Next slide, please. I don't have time to go into detail, but the first measure is, of course, to ban pesticides and limit the maintenance of vegetation. EMP also apply in the case of grazing to ensure that it is compatible with biodiversity issues, as some species may not, to may not tolerate trampling or grazing, for example. You have to know that the vegetation grows particularly strongly under the panel, despite what is it often imagined. That's why it is necessary to maintain access for the operator with more frequently vegetation maintenance intervention. 
I'm running on, out of time, so that's it for me. Thank you, and everyone, and the floor is yours, Jan Willem. Thank you so much, Etienne. It's a, it's a really nice example of um, how a forward-thinking developer can actually achieve some interesting positive outcomes for biodiversity. So thanks again for sharing that nice case study. Um, I'd now like to hand over to, to Sarah Goulart at EDP in Portugal to talk a bit about the work they're doing there to support um, conservation of a um, threatened uh, the threatened Iberian wolf. Sarah, over to you. Thank you, and thank you, and good morning. So I will be sharing an example of collaboration to better protect uh, the Siberian wolf. So this wolf is endemic in Portugal and Spain, and is threatened according to the IUCN Red List, and is fully protected by the Portuguese law. Well, wind capacity has increased significantly in Portugal since the last, uh, the late 90s and mostly last decade. And there is today around 5.5 gigawatts of installed capacity in Portugal, from which EDP owns around 1.2 gigawatts. So you can see in the map, uh, most of these wind farms, they are located in the north of Portugal. They are mostly located in remote mountain areas where the wind resources exist. And those regions overlap with wolf's land. So next slide, please. Oh, well, uh, at that time, uh, several wind projects were being planned and constructed at the same time, and legal requirements were quite demanding. Uh, wind owners were required to monitor and to compensate for their potential impacts, but those management areas, they, they were overlapping between projects. So we needed a more effective use of how to use our resources to better protect the wolf. And to overcome this challenge, uh, some wind farm owners got together and started the Iberian Wolf Habitat Conservation Association, aiming to protect the natural and cultural landscapes of the wolf distribution areas. Uh, this association was founded in, well, well, started in 2006, and this is still a success. So next slide, please. So what is uh, the, the role of this association? When looking at the mitigation hierarchy. So we have around 238 initiatives ongoing on Portugal and those are naturally mostly linked to minimizing impacts. However, monitoring and compensation still plays an important role and is on these stages that the association is more focused on. So on the monitoring side, uh, the association is covering more than 700 square kilometers of the wolf lands. Uh, they mainly monitor uh, the use tools such as GPS tracking and genetic analysis uh, for monitoring, but they also have a strong uh, focus on the compensation side. Um, they normally uh, work on and operate based on a multi-stakeholder approach engaging closely with local players such as municipalities and landowners, local NGOs, etc. And there are four main priorities and lines of work on the compensation. Can I have the next slide, please? And so these four areas, uh, I would just highlight forest management where more than 700 hectares are being managed by this association, focused mainly on reforestation. Also full management, fire and summer fires are, are quite a strong issue in Portugal. And also with invasive species management. So on the forest management side, this is where they focus. And there's another strong work line of work, which is hunting areas management, where in exchange of no hunting zones, uh, there is installation and managing feeding and artificial feeding spots. They also manage uh, prey reintroduction where the roe deer is the main prey. And finally, uh, they manage the social side of this coin, mainly engaging with the local livestock owners in rural areas, offering and monitoring herding dogs to protect their herds. Uh, well, uh, after all these years, the, the population of these wolves are, are okay. There's no evidence of regression. And if you want to meet, I think it's now for me, three minutes. So I think if, if you want to, 
would like to thank all the partners uh, that belong to this association and thanks IETN and all for having these guidelines where we can now learn and move forward and faster with this new challenge that we all have. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, yeah, another nice example that, that really highlights the importance of collaborating uh, with other developers to, to achieve uh, conservation outcomes within a, a much wider landscape. Um, okay, well, our, um, our final example is um, going to be presented by Kuhn Broker, who is with Shell. Um, and he'll be talking a little bit about um, the work that um, Shell is undertaking in the Netherlands to support biodiversity enhancement uh, around a solar farm. So Kuhn, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jan Willem. And first, I'd like to thank IUCN for uh, successfully managing this project and all other organizations and my Shell colleagues for their participation. Um, and before I kick this off, I just wanted to say that a few weeks ago, Shell released a new environmental strategy. And the theme of respecting nature is an integral part of that strategy, and it includes several new external commitments to biodiversity conservation. So if you're interested, there's more information available on our website. Um, next slide. Okay, we'll skip this slide. Next slide. So today I wanted to talk about the mitigation hierarchy step of offsetting and specifically around gaining net positive impact after solar park construction. So Shell is conducting a solar park biodiversity enhancement program in the Netherlands. And that's associated with several key research questions. And two of those are, what are the effects from solar park on insect biodiversity? And can we achieve a win-win situation for both biodiversity and solar park operations? So for the operations, this could mean benefits to, for example, permitting or reduced maintenance costs, maybe opportunities for community participation and monitoring. And for biodiversity, the objective is to get a higher diversity and abundance of vegetation and pollinator species, and not just inside the park, but potentially also outside the park. So as part of this project, we started the partnership with Naturalis Biodiversity Center, and we asked them to do a comparison of biodiversity before and after solar park construction. Additionally, we had the goal to improve biodiversity through sowing different seed mixtures and test different mowing strategies to make the area more attractive for insects and pollinators. So this was done in two sites, Moedijk, which is an industrial area, and Heerenveen, which was a former agricultural area. Next slide. So uh, a little bit more on the scope. Um, first, there was baseline monitoring. There was vegetation monitoring. They, they did soil sampling, uh, pollinator surveys were conducted. This was done twice per year to capture seasonal variation as well. Then a uh, seed mix desktop study was done and, and selections of seeds were made based on uh, yeah, what's already there, the current biodiversity situation. They looked at soil properties and they also picked species that were solar park and pollinator friendly. And that meant the plants shouldn't be too high. So up to 60 centimeters. Uh, they shouldn't have sticky pollen. Uh, and the plant species should thrive both in sunny and shaded conditions. On the operation and maintenance tactic, tactics, this was mainly around designing mowing strategies to manage the nutrient levels of the soil and ensure availability of flowering plants to pollinator throughout their flying season. And after sowing, there was ongoing on-site and off-site monitoring of these parameters that I just mentioned. Next slide. So, this is an uh, ongoing study, and we don't have all the, uh, the answers yet, but we've learned quite a bit during the first year. So first, based on uh, this Moordijk uh, study, it was concluded that solar parks can actually be a suitable habitat for pollinators. And Naturalis found in total 54 pollinator species, mainly bees and hoverfly species, which is high compared to what's normally found in agricultural and digital area. They also found five threatened bee species and over 100 species of flowering plants. Other findings were that the presence of flowering plants throughout the flying season and availability of sunny patches throughout the day were important for foraging and nesting. So previous land use had a key role as well for presence of pollinators. So for example, Heerenveen used to be an agricultural area and had very high and, and fertile soil conditions and um, yeah, presence of competitive commercial crop species. And that meant limited, limited presence of flowering herbs and no pollinators. So it's a little bit more difficult to achieve a thriving pollinator community there, and it may take a little bit more management effort. 
So a set of learnings came out of this effort. Um, I don't have time to go over them, but uh, there's a link in the next slide and you can have a look in the report if you're interested. And just to wrap this up to say that this effort is part of a, a larger multi, multiple year program. And uh, yeah, we hope to provide an update in due course. Also, we're looking how we can replicate this, uh, these learnings in our, all our uh, solar operations. So next slide, here are some links to a few other resources if you're interested. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and back to you, Jan Willem. Great, thank you, Kuhn. Um, and um, in addition to these three case studies, there are additional case studies in the, in the renewables guideline. In fact, I think there's something like 22 additional case studies um, that highlight some of the key lessons from uh, effective application of the mitigation hierarchy in a, a number of, of settings around the world. So do have a look at those. And, and with that, um, I'll hand back to, to Julia. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jan Willem. And in fact, uh, we, we, as I will explain a little bit later, we have 33 case studies in the, in the guidelines. And uh, we've talked about also how to eventually expand because every week there is a new fantastic story that comes to, you know, to our attention. So it will be really a great opportunity to find a way to keep you know, ourselves up to date with this. Um, but now I just wanted to open up with this round table of reflections. We, we realized that was gonna be very complicated to have um, a, you know, a Q and A with uh, over 700 participants on YouTube. So we are managing your questions as well as we can. Um, but we thought about inviting a few colleagues just to give us a quick reflection um, based on their, also their role. They all have something to do and to play in a role in the renewable energy. So I will call one by one. And uh, again, Ella will help by putting on the chat the more information about each speaker and also more information about what they're presenting. Um, so I'd like to start with uh, Rowan Palmer from the United Nations Environment Programme. Rowan, thank you for joining me. Thanks very much, Julia, and uh, congratulations to IUCN and all the partners uh, on the publication of the guidelines. Um, I think they're, they're clearly an important tool for reducing and managing uh, some of the trade-offs that are inherent in the development of sustainable infrastructure. Um, and I think a lot of the issues that we've heard the speakers uh, talk about just now um, impacts on migratory species and the resource footprints of renewable energy infrastructure and the importance of upstream planning, to name a few, uh, link very closely to UNEP's work on sustainable infrastructure. And the launch of the guidelines today is timely because uh, today UNEP is also launching our uh, international good practice principles for sustainable infrastructure, along with uh, an accompanying uh, set of case studies. Um, these principles are focused on the sort of upstream strategic planning end of things and the creation of an enabling policy and regulatory environment for sustainable infrastructure. Uh, but I think in order to, to implement these type of high level principles and ideas, it's necessary to have uh, more, more detailed guidance that's focused closer to the operational level. Uh, and so I think um, the guidelines you're launching today really provide that uh, and, and will no doubt be a useful tool uh, for, for planners and development. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for the chance to share my thoughts and uh, I look forward to ongoing cooperation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rowan. And yes, I mean, uh, Ayusen also was, is, was very honored to be part of the development of the UNEP uh, principles that you have mentioned. And Ella will share in the chat now the link directly to the, to the new document you have mentioned. Um, I'd like to invite now Duncan Gibb from uh, REN21. Duncan. Hello, Julia. Hello, everyone. Thank you from, from me as well for this opportunity to present uh, my views. I think that these, the, these guidelines and the presentations we've seen today are enormously valuable. Um, REN21 is a global network uh, working with, with other nonprofits, with industry, with governments on renewable energy policies and, and markets, data around the world. And it is sustainability is not a, a new topic for the renewable energy sector. I'm thinking notably about uh, about the hydropower sector, about the bioenergy sector, but it is certainly one that if we're, we're targeting a rapid expansion of our renewable energy capacity, 
capacity, one that we need to be dealing with um, more comprehensively. And I think these guidelines are very valuable um, for this end. I would also like to add um, from our perspective, we've we've seen, especially the, the, the projects discussed today, focusing mainly on the, the power sector and our work um, on renewable energy policies has pointed out that there are many countries with targets on the power sector for renewables, yet we're looking at around 166, yet fewer with targets for, um, for the other uh, the other sectors of heating and cooling and transport. And this has led us to in enlarge our work on renewables in cities. Um, and we have found that city governments are actually much more uh, ambitious on renewable energy. And they have targets uh, that are that are active in the in the other sectors and they are exactly the type of uh, stakeholders that need to be worked with to ensure that these these type of projects are, are implemented sustainably. So I'm hoping that these this, these guidelines can be used with the type of local partners that we engage with at REN21. And uh, thank you again for the chance to, to share our perspective. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to invite now Kate McClellan Press from New York, Sarada. Thank you. Good morning and thank you so much for including us in this uh, important effort as a case study. New York State is committed to 100% carbon-free electricity by 2024, with 9 gigawatts coming from offshore wind by 2035. It's the most ambitious goal in the United States and we've already made awards for over four of those nine gigawatts. And to execute on this goal in an environmentally responsible manner, the state convened an environmental technical working group, ETWIG in 2018 to advise the state on measures to avoid, minimize, and mitigate anticipated impacts on wildlife during offshore wind energy development. It's comprised of environmental non-governmental uh, organizations, offshore wind developers, and federal and state agencies. Uh, and the ETWIG's mission is to foster transparent collaborative processes to identify and address priority issues relating to wildlife monitoring and mitigation with the goals of both improving outcomes for wildlife and reducing permitting risks and uncertainty for developers. And thanks to two of our members, uh, Howard Rosenbaum and Kuhn Broker, who are panelists today. And the ETWIG's work has uh, included uh, project specific and site agnostic work to prioritize research, develop best management practices and inform environmental mitigation plans. And the success of the ETWIG as a stakeholder engagement process are really due um, to a few key things. Early and effective engagement with diverse and region-wide stakeholders that are representative of their constituencies and supportive of the ETWIG mission. Clear goals and structure within, with member input leading to actionable tasks that staff can then execute on. A focus on transparency and uh, communication with the broader stakeholder community. And lastly, uh, we really couldn't function without an amazing support staff that includes a technical expert and professional facilitators. Um, and just thank you again for including us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Kate, uh, for the, actually for sharing this experience, which is highly linked to what exactly Howard had uh, presented already. Uh, I'd like to invite Joel Merriman from ABC. Joel, over to you. Hi, thank you. It's nice to see so many people here today. I wanna to start by thanking the IUCN and partners for recognizing the importance of this issue and undertaking this effort to provide a ready-made set of guidelines. Renewable energy development is such an important part of reducing global carbon emissions, but this must be done in a way that minimizes impacts to wildlife. Ensuring that wind turbines and solar arrays are placed in locations that pose low risks to wildlife is crucial to minimizing these impacts. Some locations, such as Alliance for Zero Extinction sites, are simply not appropriate for wind turbines in particular. This is broadly recognized to the point where some major international development institutions mandate avoidance of these sites. We appreciate that the IUCN guidelines stress the importance of appropriate siting and proactively identifying good sites for development. It can be frustrating to see too many facilities still being proposed in high-risk locations for birds. It is our hope that these guidelines can help to bring a shift in this dynamic. I'd like to highlight American Bird Conservancy's wind risk assessment map, the URL for which should be showing up in the chat box. Much like the BirdLife International map that Trish showed us earlier, we developed this tool for use by developers, regulatory agencies, and advocates to inform risk assessment at proposed wind energy facilities in the United States. We encourage stakeholders to visit the map, particularly when they're in early stages of wind facility planning, to determine if there are areas that should be avoided or approached with extreme caution. 
We encourage stakeholders elsewhere to develop or adopt similar tools to inform appropriate wind energy project siting. Thanks to the IUCN effort we learned about today, this approach to high-risk site avoidance can complement adoption and requirement of a set of practices to minimize impacts to birds and other wildlife. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share. Oh, thank you, Joel. Um, I'd like now to go to and start hearing a little bit about financing. And uh, Laurie Anna Conso from the International Finance Corporation. Over to you, Anna. Thank you, uh, Julia. Could you hear me okay? I hope so. <laughs> Um, okay, so so many things to say on this topic. Um, for me, um, I see the most, uh, really one of the most pressing agenda items is how biodiversity could be uh, better mainstreamed into both the technical and the commercial uh, considerations. Um, by technical, for example, for onshore wind, I'm talking about the energy yield assessment. And um, for commercial, um, again, for example, talking about the structure of power purchase agreements. Um, I think this is what it's meant. You know, when we say mainstreaming biodiversity is to really to understand the industry and to influence the industry from the inside outward. But those are very big topics. Um, I'm going to leave them there and just uh, touch on two other quickie reflections uh, for consideration uh, in the group. Um, the first involves something that we heard about before, but I really think it's worth um, saying again, and that's the topic of transmission lines. Um, we really cannot disassociate the discussion of transmission lines from wind and solar. Um, where you have a power generation projects, there must be a high voltage transmission line to evacuate that power uh, to the grid. Um, and what we're seeing in IFC is oftentimes the uh, risk with respect to the transmission lines is, is actually, uh, to birds at least, is higher um, than the, the turbines themselves. So it's really something to be discussed part and parcel, not, not two different topics, same topic. Um, second bit, second reflection is a bit of a challenge. Um, and that topic is green bonds and the automatic inclusion of uh, wind power projects in them. Um, in a nutshell here, um, if the project is not cited responsibly, if there is not adequate bird and bat baseline data, and for onshore wind, if there is not a robust post-construction fatality monitoring program, it's not green. End of story. I think as a collective, we have to be a little more stringent on how we're automatically giving the green tag to anything that's, that's wind and solar. Uh, we, we all know that we need renewable energy, wind, solar, and, uh, and other technologies to be, to be rolled out. They are being aggressively rolled out, uh, which, is, which is great. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's a little bit more work to do on um, uh, considering uh, biodiversity and mainstream biodiversity, especially in, uh, in emerging market countries. So thank you. Thank you very much, Laurie, for raising these additional mm -hmm. challenges, which, uh, yeah, they are critical. And we will discuss also further of how we, we have addressed them or, you know, opportunities for, fu for future. Um, still on the question of financing, I'd like to invite Ben Jobson from IBAT to join us. Thanks very much indeed, Julia. Uh, IBAT, we're very pleased to have been involved in the collaborative developments of these new guidelines. They'll certainly be a really valuable resource and they come at a, a crucial time for this renewable energy transition. IBAD itself, or um, the Integrated Biodiversity Assessment Tool, is the world's most authoritative biodiversity data tool uh, as it provides the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species, the World Database on Protected Areas, and the World Database of Key Biodiversity Areas through a web-based mapping and reporting tool. Uh, and IBAT is primarily for commercial entities to access these data sets and to conduct risk screening of their assets and the potential investments that they're, they're looking into. Following on from Laurie, um, the IFC are a fantastic example of a diligent IBAT user. And we actually have a, a bespoke IFC PS6 report that focuses on critical habitat. Um, now, as we previously heard, Sensitivity mapping and strategic environmental assessments are the best approaches for planning wind and solar energy due to the need to consider the, the particular risks to wildlife and the need for strategic development. Um, in the majority of cases, data from the IBAS Alliance can contribute to these types of analyses, uh, but where there are no such analyses or maps, 
investors will still need to screen their wind and solar investments to ensure they haven't overlooked potential impacts on biodiversity. And their green bonds projects are really green, uh, as Laurie was um, indicating. After all, from the published literature, um, one paper that we heard about earlier, we've seen many instances of wind and solar being cited in protected areas and KBAs. Um, and additionally, as, as Pippa was mentioning, um, mining will see a big increase uh, as we're expected to require additional materials for renewables and IBAT will be relevant there as well. Um, so in relation to this topic, IBAT have released a briefing note for wind and solar energy, which should be in the link, uh, a link should be in the chat box um, and it can contextualize the use of IBAT for these renewables. We also have a, a bespoke freshwater risk screening report relevant for hydropower. Uh, so please do follow the link and direct any questions on IBAT through to our website. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ben. Yes, and we are sharing the links to all the work that you guys have mentioned as we speak. And then I'll, we'll also make sure that you will receive an email later on with all the information all captured in one, one email. Um, next, I'd like to invite Felicity Spores from the Gold Standard Foundation. Thank you, Felicity. Hello, and thanks, Julia. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and to build on what's just been said about finance. Um, it's really exciting to be able to utilize these guidelines to do exactly what I think it was, um, who was it who said it uh, earlier? I can't remember his name from TCN, who was suggesting there's an opportunity to buy down risk um, when you actually consider biodiversity at the start of your project activities. And um, the reason that we're very excited about the guidelines is that their direct application in a blended finance vehicle, which has just been granted from the Green Climate Fund, um, $150 million in concessional finance and $28 million uh, in grant. And this fund is being managed um, with IUCN, R20, and private sector investors, that's Pegasus Impact Investors and BNP Paribas. And it is really interesting because finance is looking for good sustainable impact. Yes, they want climate, but they are becoming aware of the interlinkage of things like biodiversity and climate, and they want to get it right. And this blended finance vehicle is a first of its kind because Gold Standard, we're a standard setting organization, is developing with IUCN and building on these thresholds the criteria to help guide that strategic knowledge from the impact investors side so that it's a seamless project flow to really bringing equity to low income countries. The fund is going to be totaled. So we've got a big sum of money from the, the Green Climate Fund, but because of the de-risking, the de-risking in the form of being open about the need to address both biodiversity and climate, um, it is seen as a de-risking mechanism by the private sector, as well as of course, having the technical assistance or the grant funding to buy down the risk of going to those activities they wouldn't normally go to, which is low income, middle income countries. This fund will feature subnational projects at the scale of five to 75 million. So we're talking me medium sized for seven years. So it's a seven year investment time. And the leverage is to get it to this capitalize it at 750 million. That means the expectation is that private money will be attracted by such a model, which is considering biodiversity and um, climate and certifying it ex ante uh, as seen as a real way forward. And I think it's totally vital to have this conversation in a post COVID environment um, where clearly we need to reboot and regenerate and we are very much more aware of how important nature is. And, and the, the fund is expected to actually generate 1.8 gigawatts of good renewable energy. So not the uh, non-biodiversity friendly, but good renewable energy that's mindful of the impact on biodiversity. 20,000 direct jobs being mindful of COVID, avoiding CO2 being mind mindful of four, up to 4 million tonnes and improving living conditions. And we hope to be the case study, you know, with IUCN showing how standards, guidelines can drive and steer funding to where it needs to go to make the world a better place. That's our dream. And I'm looking forward to working with Julia and the team to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felicity, for uh, painting this dream. And it's, I think it's a dream that we all share and we have been sharing for the past 18 months. 
Um, let's now just ask Rebecca Burton from IRMA just to give us a little bit of an overview also on other challenging issues that is associated to renewable energy. Uh, over to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Julia. And even though I'm here at the end of the speaker lineup, I wanted to speak briefly about uh, the beginning of this entire process, which yes, has a lot of its challenges, the mining of materials that go into renewable energy. So Pippa Howard of FFI introduced so well the importance of looking at mining, especially when we're looking at the protection of biodiversity. So I thank her for setting the stage and thank many of you for referring to the importance of looking at the upstream. So as the expansion of renewable energy continues, we really need to pay attention to the sourcing of the various minerals and metals that go into the actual infrastructure itself. So IRMA, the Initiative for Responsible Mining is one way to do that. We're a voluntary certification system to assess practices at the mine site. And we measure those practices against best practice, current best practice. We're the only certification system in the mining uh, sector that offer that covers all mined materials and does so with full multi-stakeholder governance. So it means that the voices of communities and civil society, including NGOs that are focused on the environment, are equally represented in setting out what the requirements should be and in governing the system itself. And they sit alongside mining companies and purchasing companies that use mined materials to do that. So we launched certification of mines in late 2019, and we now have mines beginning to re release their audit reports. These are often 100 page plus documents that have a level of transparency about what's happening at the mine sites that is, has yet uh, been unseen in the mining sector. And it also includes how the mine is protecting biodiversity and ecosystems. So I would just close by emphasizing that while mining often occurs far away from where renewable energy is produced, often in even a totally different country, mining and extraction can have a host of impacts on biodiversity and really needs to be considered with equal gravity as how renewable energy projects are managed as well. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for making this point, as, as you mentioned, is actually the beginning of the chain and how important to, it is to remember also that. So we have now finished with the, all our panelists, and um, I just want to thank everybody. I mean, the, the NGOs, the businesses that have participated in the first two panels, and all the guests that have agreed to come and, you know, spend just a minute and a half of and I know it was rushed, but you have shared so much information. So just to reconfirm all what you have shared, the slides, the links to the, for example, existing programs will all be available. We'll, we'll, we are putting together a thank you email, which include links to everything. Now, let me just quickly give you a little bit of an overview about the guidelines, which is also one of the reasons, the excuse for which we have you know, created this, uh, designed this event. So this is the cover. Um, Ella is now going to put in the, in the chat uh, the link to the guidelines where you can download them. But again, we are going to send you an email with everything nicely organized so you can see everything. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of points about them. First of all, we focus only on three technologies. So we focus on solar, offshore wind, and onshore wind. We didn't, we didn't um, by design, we wanted to have a very, very um, precise focus because we wanted to be able to give enough technical guidance for the project developers. Uh, but as we said, this is the beginning. There are a lot of other, you know, renewable energy technologies to, to look at. And this is part of the conversations we are having with uh, the companies and, uh, and others to say, is there going to be a, uh, a next project? And if the next project, what should we address? What I wanted to mention about the guidelines is that because they focus on three specific technologies, we, can, we have been able to provide very, very detailed advice. This advice, and that's the other thing I think is uniqueness is that is, is organized around along, sorry, not so much around, along the mitigation hierarchy and along the, the, the different stages of a project. So we are trying to be as, as precise as possible. What is a, an avoidance measure? What is an, a minimization measure? What is restoration? What is enhancement? When is offset acceptable? And when we think is not acceptable and so on for the three different technologies. Um, the document at the moment is available as a one document. 
There is also an annex, which is um, available separately because we plan to keep it up to date. And this is Annex 1, which includes a lot of interesting resources, guide, you know, links to a lot of other guidelines that are existing. And the plan is to keep this up to date. Also, if you read that and you want to put forward a, a suggestions on other guidelines, please let me know. Um, a second annex includes the 33 case studies that some of them were presented today, but there are many, many more. And again, I would like to thank not just the author of the, of the guidelines, but also the many people that contributed with their case studies, as these are really enriched the document. Um, and as I'm in the thanking mode, I like also to thank all the people that actually reviewed the document. And this, we took, you know, we had two revision and it was really amazing how much, you know, um, how many comments and the richness of these comments that we have received from other, you know, other utilities, uh, NGOs, industry associations, other international organizations has been really, really uh, an honor to be on the receiving side to see so much interest about these. Um, so, as I said, the, what we are planning to do now is to make these guidelines also available in a more um, easy way. So we are going to break them down in chapters, but this is going to happen in the next couple of weeks. And we are going to make also available a synthesis report that you can use also, let's say, for more the C-suite decision makers. Um, and also we are going to have three focus technical sessions. These are going to be more kind of training, longer, very focused. One is going to be on solar, one on offshore wind, and one on onshore wind. We are going to advertise these sessions through our website and also to we are going to send an email to all those who actually have signed up for this webinar who confirmed that they want to stay in contact we will automatically invite you to these technical sessions uh, another thing that we are about to complete is um, guidance a guidance document for financing institutions to complement the the information that ibat has produced uh, this guidance note will help with specific questions that link specific features of the, you know, the three technologies with species that are known to be sensitive to those. Again, this is early planning, very early risk screening. And as mentioned also some, you know, in the, some of the comments, these tools can be used as, as long as the data is good. And that's obviously always an issue, especially for the early, early risk screening. So to conclude, I think this project was amazing, but also because we have been, we had such a great, you know, an incredible opportunity to work with colleagues that had, you know, came to the table with a very common vision of, about let's make this happen. We want, we need expansion of renewable energy, and we need to make sure that this happens in a way that will not cost the earth. And this, it was, we were completely aligned. NGOs, conservation, or you know, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, the companies, IUCN, the first meeting, and this was when we still had the chance to meet in person, was really five days of really intense discussions about this is the vision, what are the challenges from a scientific perspective and the technical perspective. We hope that with these guidelines, we have addressed some of the issues. Um, next, we are already into discussions and it will be fantastic to hear from all of you. We, you know, our email is out. Uh, what is next on our on the agenda? We would like to continue working in the, with the same spirit of collaboration, bringing together conservation organization and businesses on specific projects. We aim to have very you know focused activities to complement also the many initiatives that are out there. Uh, we have you know already discussed ideas on. Uh, working more in depth in the supply chain and looking at how biodiversity can be factored from really the extractive all the way down to end of life. We have talked about mitigation hierarchy, testing it at the project level. We have talked about other uh, um, te technologies and issues that are not covered by, you know, for example, by the guidelines that we have talked about now. We talked about cumulative assessments and and uh, working specifically on land, um, on land, on land planning. Um, so with that, I like to now ask um, my colleague to start a video. We have also produced a little video that is supposed to promote this concept about renewable energy and the need for more renewable energy in line with biodiversity conservation. And after that, I will say goodbye. So, Gillian, could you please play the video for us?
All right. Thank you so much, Gillian, for playing the video. Thank you all. Uh, we have come to the end of our meeting. I just wanted to pick one of the um, one of the sentences in the video is help us make renewable energy everything it should be. And I think this is why we are we feel so strong that we are on the right path because we have this vision. We are sharing this vision and we really need each other's help to make this happen. So thank you. We, we will get in touch with all of you soon. And thank you again for being with us today. And bye-bye. <laughs>